screen shared. Hopefully, there we go. Does everyone see that and you can hear me? Yes, we can and we can see it. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm Lizzie Wank. Um, I'm at UNSW and I will be talking today on documenting the Austrates ontology and I'm speaking on behalf of our entire team with a special thanks to the ARDC, which is providing our funding, helping us develop into a national data asset. Um, and briefly, I just want to introduce Austrates, um, Australia's largest plant traits database. And then what I'm talking about today is much like Edmund, a very specific case example, um, rather than sort of a large level under a large level ontology that's very domain specific. So I've been working, and this is still in progress, documenting the Austrade structure in an ontology. And this is very much an exercise in using existing vocabularies to document our database structure, in turn, hoping that we can have a larger impact and have the ontology we develop reused by others. And then secondly, at the very end, I'll touch upon a separate project, which is establishing an Australian plant traits dictionary, merging many existing resources into a unified referenced um, dictionary that's actually missing among plant ecologists. Um, and so in both cases, we're really hoping that by building an ecology, we will be increasing our impact. So why do we need a big plant database? Um, research and conservation require big, accurate, accessible data sets. If you want to understand how leaf size varies across the globe, if you want to look at the evolution of floral traits, you need to have trait data in a readily accessible tabular format for analysis. Conservation also depends upon these resources. Following the 2020 bushfires, having all traits and being able to rapidly look up which plant species resprouted following a fire and which were killed allowed people to prioritize the use of funding to protect the most endangered species. But as across most disciplines, data in plant ecology is scattered across endless resources in endless formats. And coming from a university background, I know very much that the concept of an ontology is foreign to people, and they're going to much more prioritize their own research agenda to trying to create a standardized output. So we've been hoping to do that through Austraits. Austraits was first released in September last year with a concurrent release of um, a data paper in scientific data, and the data set was released on Zenodo. It incorporates more than 300 data sets contributed by more than 200 contributors. Um, in some, there are nearly 500 unique traits and more than 1 million rows of data. We have at least one trait value for nearly all of Australia's 30,000 plant species. As the graphic in the middle suggests, some traits have good coverage. We have plant growth form data for nearly every species, and for others, we might have covered for just 50 to 100 species. Our workflow um, is all open source, hosted on an open um, GitHub repository, and it harmonizes and standardizes those data sets, first taking those original data formats sitting on each person's computer, um, wrangling them into the raw data inputs that our script can use, and then going through aligning trait names to a controlled vocabulary to our trait dictionary, updating taxonomy to match the Australian plant census, which follows Darwin core, adding common units, et cetera, to create our harmonized database. The output itself is a series of relational tables. There's a core traits table. Um, this is a bit of a stylized version, but core information like the taxon name, a location, trait name, and a value. And this links to a series of ancillary tables by the highlighted column headers. And I will be talking about a few of these as I talk about our ontology, but pay special attention to locations and context. So that's where we stood a year ago. Um, and one of our big 
projects over the past year has been compiling our workflow into a standalone R package, which will very shortly be released, um, allowing any group of ecologists for any taxonomic group to build their own trait database. The impetus for this was when a group of invertebrate ecologists approached us and asked if they could reuse Oz traits to make an invertebrate trait database. So a group simply needs to add data. They need to have their own trait dictionary, their own taxonomic resource, but everything else required is provided. And this, of course, led to the next thing. If another group was using our data structure, we really needed to establish a true ontology to more properly define what each and every term meant. Um, and in fact, two ontologies. One is an ontology for the database structure. And the second is much more specific to our OS traits for plant trait data is an ontology of our trait dictionary. Now, I will say that ecologists, the concept of ontology is completely foreign. When I started working on OS traits, I had never thought about this. And still, when I talk to anyone within our department about what we're doing, they kind of look at us blankly. Darwin core and taxonomic standards are the only thing that crosses their mind. Um, from the beginning, OS traits was broadly aligned to OBO. Daniel Foster, the project lead, had been involved in the original development of OBO. Um, and this has worked fantastically well for a trait database, um, for especially for ecology. There's some core classes, the entity, the object of interest, that which is being measured. On that, there is an observation made. The observation is a cluster of measurements, a, a single group of rows of data. Each measurement is a single row of data. That is a measurement of a single trait and references some trait concept within our controlled data dictionary. Being extensible is perfect. One of the reasons we were really attracted to OBO. So we can link that core observation of a, of a plant to its location, to any other contextual information. And within ecology, these contexts are absolutely essential. A plant, a trait value measured has no meaning without knowledge about the location and the context. And the location, these are in of themselves observations of entities. Location is an entity, the context property is an entity. And then as building an ontology has been a very iterative process for us. One of the first questions was, well, wait a minute, what is the entity? We didn't have entity in our original database structure. And as we talked about this, we realized that actually within OS traits, we have three types of entities. Sometimes the observation is on an individual. Sometimes it's on a population. Sometimes it's for an entire species. And so we extended the backbone of our, our OBO ontology such that each of these represents a broader subset, a broader number of rows of data to narrower and narrower groupings. This brought the next thought bubble for our group. Now, where do we link con contextual information in our expanded hierarchy? And at different points is the answer. Quite a bit of it we have linked to this level where, where you make an observation at a population level. So the location, plot context, this is something, so many researchers will give us a specific geographic location, but within that they identify some level of stratified variation, such as the top and bottom of a slope. There's also actual manipulative treatments. You've added nitrogen to the soil for some groups of individuals and not others. We also have temporal context. If a single individual, if there are multiple observations on an individual over time, perhaps during the wet and the dry season. And OBO has continued to allow us to add all these things. This diagram could go on and on, adding identifiers, adding other links, um, but it's worked well for us. But now I'm going to jump to the process of when we actually look at our output table, 
it also aligns remarkably closely with another ontology that was recently published, the Ecological Trait Data Standard, which is itself an extension of Darwin Core, the well-established framework for biodiversity databases. Um, the Ecological Trait Data Standard has quite similar tables to ours with quite similar um, headers. Ours is actually an extension in that they don't provide the detailed information on locations or context that we are able to capture. So I've taken this and I am very much a novice still and welcome feedback, but I have taken my much more elaborate mind maps than I've shown here and built an ontology and protege that's consistent with OBO, the Ecological Trait Data Standard and Darwin Core. It reuses terms from many different ontologies. Among them, all our sources align with BibTeX. Contributors are identified by ORCIDs. The contributor information aligns to data site and various other individual terms I have used. We've tried as much as we can to always reuse terms, not developing quite few of our own. Um, the process also, I spent a lot of time looking at three actual database ontologies that build upon OBO to try and understand how one does this. Um, it's There have been some difficulties and a lot of time spent. I think one of my hardest ones, and this will be familiar probably to many of you in the room, is understanding conflicts between reused terms. So as a, well, the example that's frustrated me the most is that within OBO, measurement value, the actual value of a trait is a class. Within the ecological trait data, it's a data type property. So ETS, each of their tables is considered a class, but all the columns within them are data type properties. So here I have the same identical concept and a fairly core one for a, for a scientific table, trait value table, um, but they are fundamentally different. Um, and it's been hard for me even to reconcile um, because value is in some ways both. It's the property of a trait, but it also has some of its own properties, units, value type. And of course, since I'm borrowing from these two ontologies to build our own, I sort of need the context around both of these terms. At the moment, they're mapped as equivalent values, which I am quite certain is not an ideal solution. Um, and I guess this is part of a broader tug of war, and it's been very interesting to listen to the talks. Um, as I said, I came at this from the perspective of a field ecologist, and the more I look at ontologies, the more I appreciate them, and they've really forced a lot of semantic clarity in our project. But I also realized that the very simple table format that ETS has is much more approachable to most ecologists. And now for the last few minutes, I'm just going to jump across to our plant traits dictionary. Um, so for those 500 traits, we have a trait dictionary that's associated with Oz traits. Every trait is defined, allowable trait values um, for, a, a new, for a categorical trait or ranges for a numeric trait are included. And it's transparent, accessible, and easy to update. Um, I've presented this to a number of international audiences, and they've been saying this is now the new gold standard of, of a plant trait dictionary. So that's been heartening, but we know it can get even better. Um, and is another resource really needed? Um, and much like with the ontology for the database structure, where we see an ontology being necessary, not just for our own database, but to have the actual database structure reusable by other groups, we're also hoping that if we publish a trait dictionary, those definitions can also be more easily reused. Um, and so what's out there? Um, anyone who's a plant ecologist is probably familiar with TRI. It's got at least 10 times as many records as Austraits does, but it has definitions for only a small subset of its 2000 traits. And from an Australian perspective, it has quite poor coverage for um, traits related to fire, for instance, that are interesting to Australian plant ecologists. There are published publications that are trait handbooks that exist for about 50 traits, 
but certainly nowhere near 500. Um, I've delved deeply into the published ontologies, and there's an absolute wealth of data within them. But again, ecologists don't go to these, and I think in part because of how constrained each definition is um, to a certain hierarchy and meaning. There does exist one um, published trait dictionary for plants, but it's, again, quite incomplete and hasn't been updated since its inception. We've been in touch with the group that developed TOP, and they'd be very excited to sort of jumpstart that again using our trait dictionary as a basis. So 15 that's, minutes less. Uh, okay. I have two slides left. Um, so we're going forward from here, trying to make our trait dictionary fairer in prep for publishing it. We're adding keywords and trait categories, so broader and narrower concepts. Um, we're adding references wherever possible. We're adding links to whatever trait databases and ontologies do exist, such that our trait dictionary will be interoperable. And then we are getting ready to publish our definitions. And um, hopefully through Research Vocabularies Australia, and a special thanks to Rowan Brownlee for helping me navigate this and have get a draft pulled together. Um, and I'll just end by saying we're very mindful of what our community wants. So I now can navigate an ontology, but we want to make sure we put out a trade dictionary that truly does get reused. Um, so just going to say thank you. And here are different resources for Oz traits. And if anyone does ever want to go look at my very much of a draft owl file, feedback is most welcome. Thank you.